Okay, hello. Uh, that looks like we are live. Uh, cool, I'll get us started. Um, thank you everyone for, for joining in already and, and who've been hanging around for a minute. Um, I can see the Moom in chat has said that they are joining us for the first time uh, and they're gonna have a nice little lurk. So thank you for joining, thank you for lurking. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and introduce the topic that we're gonna be um, going over today, which is uh, the same theme that we've been doing uh, as Safe in Our World throughout the month, which is obsessive compulsive disorder, um, also sometimes known as OCD. Now, OCD is a mental health condition um, that causes people to have recurring obsessions and compulsions, hence the name. Um, despite the fact that it's actually quite common, um, OCD is still often extremely misunderstood and actually extremely st stigmatized. Um, I'm sure that probably a lot of us here and a lot of you in chat can think of times where, you know, people have contributed to the stigma around OCD because it is one of those things that unfortunately has become like, you know, just a cultural phrase that people use. Um, in, in reality, um, which we'll go on to talk more about with the panelists, um, OCD can, can be formed by a number of things, but one of those is obsessive thought, obsessive thoughts. Um, and some of the more, more common or more well-known ones of those are things like fears of contamination, uh, a need for order and for stuff to be like arranged in a certain way, um, or an, a, a need um, or an obsession with like collecting items um, or like hoarding, it's also known as sometimes. Um, but there are a lot of other ways that obsessions can manifest. So it could be things like intrusive thoughts or images, which are often quite upsetting in nature to look at um or, or you know kind of have in your head um or obsessive worrying about certain scenarios like worrying that you're going to cause harm to someone um or something like that uh, and then the the compulsive side and a compulsion is a behavior that attempts to deal with those obsessive thoughts so it's something you kind of do as a result of those obsessive thoughts oftentimes um so for example someone might have an obsessive uh, worry or anxiety around doors being unlocked or feeling unsafe. And then the compulsive behavior that they do kind of as a result of that is like checking locks repeatedly, for example. Um, the the panelists that we have joining us today who are gonna introduce themselves in a minute um, are, are people who have lived experience with OCD um, and our, our goal through this panel is hopefully to shed a little more light on it, um, help people understand it a little, little bit better um, with the with the main intention of being able to destigmatize and kind of demystify um, OCD as a condition. So thank you everyone so, so much for joining. Um, I'll go around now and let you all introduce yourselves. Uh, I'm just gonna kind of go in in order of where I can see you um, on the screen. So Victoria, if you'd like to introduce yourself first, just tell us kind of who you are, what you do, etc. Yeah, hi, I'm Victoria Phillips Kennedy. I'm a news reporter at Eurogamer and I was diagnosed with OCD a little over eight years ago. Nice, thank you. Uh, Chad, would you like to go next, please? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, yeah. All right, I just want to make sure. Uh, hello, everybody, it's good to be here. My name is Chad Bouton, pronouns are he, him. I am 30 years old, out of the great state of Florida in the United States. I am a blind advocate, um, also a accessibility consultant for video games. I'm the host of a disability podcast called The Unsighted Radio. And recently, uh, this month, I became the marketing director for an assistive technology company out of the UK called Adapt IT. And I also have OCD, anxiety, and depression. So, lots going on with me. <laughs> Thank what you so much. Trick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Katie, would you like to go next, please? Yeah, sure. So, I'm Katie Robson. Um, I work at Ubisoft Reflections, which is based in Gosforth, which is near Newcastle upon Tyne in the UK. Um, I'm in HR myself, so I'm not actually a developer, um, but I'm in HR, I'm a junior HR operations specialist. God, it's such a long title, I can barely ever remember it. Um, and I have struggled with um, OCD to varying degrees since I was 19. Um, I'm now about to turn 33 tomorrow. 
Um, oh, happy birthday, birthday for time. tomorrow. Happy early birthday. <laughs> Thank you. Early birthday. Day three. Yay. <laughs> it's the age Jesus was when he died. Random fact. Cool. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, don't ask me whether it's the first time or the second time. I do not know. <laughs> awesome. I only know that because of Fleabag. Oh, give it one more year and you'll be able to oh, say you've outlived you. Jesus. So I like, outlived Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so that's me. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Um... <laughs> Yeah, Mario, would you like to, to go next, please? Sure. I'm uh, Mario Margola. I'm from New Jersey. I am a uh, narrative designer at uh, Miami Avalon Games, which is an independent company in UK. So I'm used to hearing all your accents a lot because <laughs> I hear them every week on a meeting. Um, I did not know I had OCD for the longest time. And it actually was only pointed out because my wife is a behavioral consultant. She started noticing... Um, OCD behaviors actually in our kids. And between that and a conversation I had with a relative of mine a couple of years ago, I just kept saying to myself, all those things sound a lot like me. Like every, every thing that was discussed, every symptom, I was like, oh, that, that sounds like me. And I just walk away from it, not realizing anything until finally um, it was an actual diagnosis for my kid. And I kind of looked into it and said, that is, that is me to a T. So only in the past year has it become uh, actually an official thing for me. And official versus, you know, I'm 37. So 37 years of not of really not knowing what, just thinking like I'm sure we're going to get into, it's more quirks than anything else, kind of realizing, no, there's, there's a thing there. So I'm new to, I'm new to, have, to knowing I have it and not new to having it. So it's been yeah. a weird journey there. Thank you. That's such, that's fascinating. Like such an interesting way to, to kind of come around to, realizing that about yourself um yeah i can see we we're being joined by a few more people in the chat we've got um chachi who's joined us on a panel previously actually um who said that they are really keen to learn more about ocd that isn't stereotypes um and then rosie as well um yeah yeah um rosie said that she's learned so much about ocd this month with the research that she's been doing for our content for anyone who might not be aware rosie's safe and hours content community manager um, and also for that article that I, I think a lot of you or all of you contributed to, um, which it was really nice because um, we were saying just before we went live, um, I can't remember who like mentioned it initially, but we were talking about how it, it, it was really nice to have that article that everyone had contributed toward because I think each of you said that it made you, one, feel less alone, but two, like have another way of explaining things, like to help people mm. to understand it, which I think is really cool. And that's something that's happened on like a few of these panels previously, like for, you know, like conditions and things that I have as well. And like that our panelists have had where you hear someone explain it and you're like, oh, like, yeah, I'm going to use that now because that will help people get it properly. Or like that will really help yeah. me explain this thing that I have been living with and haven't been able to verbalize. Um, so, yeah, I think that's really cool um anyway we'll, we'll get into the questions um but just before we do that i'm going to give a real quick kind of housekeeping um once over for the chat so please if you have comments and questions please do feel free to put them in the chat that being said please make sure that they are respectful um if anyone is being you know rude disrespectful bigoted etc um you will just get removed um, so please keep it nice and we will we will try and come to those uh, as and when they come in um, but in the meantime I have a few questions prepared and my first one is um, when did you first get diagnosed with OCD which uh, some of you have have kind of alluded to um, already and what led up to that diagnosis so Victoria I'll pick on you to go first again <laughs> so for me uh, similar actually to you Mario where I, I've always had these kind of quirks or whatever as you described them and I didn't really think anything of it but then uh, a little over eight years ago I was pregnant with my daughter and I had incredibly bad pre and postnatal depression and I kept going through things and then I kept kind of almost bargaining with myself to try and be like it'll get better if I can do this it'll get better if I can do this it'll get better if I can do this and for me again I just kind of thought that this was just me trying to regain control. I didn't really think anything, you know, of like a wider mental health condition at this point. Um, but then it got to the point where I had a very severe break, which I can go into more or less detail. I don't know how triggering this can be. Uh, I, I, from my perspective, it's entirely up to you. Um, 
Okay, yeah. well. All good. What if you yeah, feel good here. Sharing? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. I mean, I'm I'm happy to share. I just don't want to upset anyone. Um, I basically got to the point where I was having these incredibly intrusive, very very violent thoughts, and it got to the point where I was like, I can't live with this anymore. I'm just gonna have to call it a day. I can't live anymore, essentially. And it was awful. Um, the what stopped me was I also have a son who's a little bit older. And I was like, I can't, I can't leave him basically. Um, but I was obviously in an incredibly bad way. And it got to the point where my husband came home one day and I was just on the bed. Like I wasn't responding to our child, anything like this. Uh, and I went to a doctor for an emergency appointment and obviously I got diagnosed with severe postnatal depression. I got put on medication, et cetera. And I went to a psychologist and there I explained some of the things I'd been experiencing. I explained how I'd been putting, I'd had all these thoughts coming into my mind that were, as I said, incredibly horrific thoughts. Uh, I was getting incredibly anxious because I thought these thoughts would be realized. And I was saying I was trying to control them by, you know, coming up with my compulsions. And I would be like, if I can predict the color of the car that's going to pass me next, everything will be okay. And I'd get a relief if it was like a red car and I'd said it was going to be a red car. But then, you know, that cycle would begin again. Uh, and that's when they were like, well, that's, that's OCD. That is what you have. And I was like, oh, like, I thought, and I'm sure, you know, we'll discuss this further. I was like, but I thought OCD was like, you can't step up on a line or you have to have everything at right angles, which is not my problem at all, which you guys can probably see <laughs> from my, my chaos behind me. You know, if you open my linen cupboard, it's literally going to be like a cascade of cotton falling down on you. There is no order there at all. And I was like, well, no, I can't have OCD because I'm really messy. And they're like, no, no, that's really not what it is. And then suddenly, you know, similar again, what you were saying, Mario, like, I was like, oh, like so many other things make sense now because I was looking back at things I did as a teenager obviously pre-diagnosis and I was like that was not actually what everyone else was doing that was OCD that was something that I was trying to control in my mind and I was getting these compulsions and I had to control it by doing these rituals in my head um and since then you know I'm still on medication for it uh, today and I probably will be for I assume the rest of my life it works it's brilliant I'm very happy with how it goes but I just hadn't had that understanding because of the fact that OCD is not usually addressed as being this internal mental health uh, condition. Like I said, it's like lines or right angles and things. So that diagnosis eight years ago has been, you know, I, I don't want to sound overdramatic, but it has been life changing for the better to have that diagnosis and I now know what it is. And similar, um, I know it's, you know, mentioned that it can be hereditary. There are a few quirks I've noticed in my daughter now, which I'm kind of keeping an eye on. But I kind of, I love that I now have that knowledge and I can help her if this is what it turns out to be. Yeah. And hopefully others listening as well. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing and, and thank you for being willing to be vulnerable about this. Um, I have just put the link to our resource page in the chat. So if anyone does feel like anything that we talk about over the course of the panel is um, a little bit triggering or, or upsetting, um, then either type exclamation mark S-I-O-W in chat to get a link to our website, or you can just um, follow the link that I just popped in there um, for global resources and helplines and information. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Victoria. Um, Chad, uh, same question. So, so to summarize, when did you first get diagnosed and, and what kind of led up to that? Um, yeah, so it's actually hereditary in my family. My, my father um, has OCD and his is the more kind of classic, oh, if he sees a crooked picture, he fixes it. If, you know, towels aren't hanging straight, he fixes it. So he's he has OCD, he's on medicine for it. Um, so he... Thank you, know, just wonderfully, thank you, Dad, for passing it down to me. Um, and the first time I was ever diagnosed with OCD, I was actually uh, eight years old. So I'm 30 now. I, I've known I've had OCD for over 22 years, and I've been wow. on medicines for it for over 22 years. Um, and for me, you know, my parents just kind of started noticing, you know, just certain behaviors that I would like hyper fixate on. So some of like the classics is the doors, like if. I lock a door, I don't think it's locked, I go back and check it. And I do that about five times. And my parents are just like, Chad, stop checking the door. You locked it. Um, if I ask a question to someone, and I, like, hey, Dad, can you help me with my math homework? And he doesn't answer. Then I'm like, hey, Dad, can you help me with my homework? Hey, Dad, can you, like, I'll help you with your homework. I heard you the first time. But I'm like, but you didn't answer me. So I obsessed over the fact that you weren't answering me because I wanted an answer. Um, and I wouldn't stop until I had the answer of yes or no. So just these little small things that they were noticing. And obviously, with my dad having OCD, 
you know, my mom and him were talking. He's like, I think he has OCD like myself. And my mom's like, are you sure? He's like, I'm almost positive. So when we moved back to Florida, because my dad was in the military, um, in the Air Force, the U.S. Air Force, we moved around a lot. Um, once we moved back into Florida in 2000, around 2001 or two was when I got the diagnosis. Um, and I do have, you know, the traditional, you know, still to this day, you know, check the locked doors. If um, things aren't placed in a certain way that I like them, I put them there. And if, if someone moves it, put it back. And I'm just like, don't move that. It was there for a reason. Um, but I don't have the whole clean, you know, cleansing, cleanliness thing. I don't have the whole like, oh, everything in my binders or my covers are perfect. Like, no, if you open something like a closet in my house, you're probably getting stuff smashed into your head or your body as it falls off on you. Um, <laughs> but I, I noticed over the years more and more is the whole invasive and intrusive thoughts. Um, and I deal with that every day. Mm -hmm. So every morning I'm up at 6 a.m. because I got to get up to feed my guide dog. Um, and, you know, right now here in the States, it's still dark at 6 a.m. And, you know, I mentioned how I'm blind, so I can't see in the dark or really see in general. <laughs> so when I'm taking my dog um, out to go to the bathroom, um, we have to walk a little bit into the road and then there's like, like a circle of grass that I let him do his business at. And no lie, every morning around 6.20, as I'm walking across that little part, it's not even like more than like maybe 10 steps. I always have the same reoccurring intrusive thought. I'm either gonna get hit by a car or someone's gonna pop out of the middle of nowhere and shoot me dead. Um, so I always have that intrusive thought <laughs> around 6.20 or 6.30 in the morning. Um, that just trying to take my dog outside, I'm going to either get hit by a car or, or shot or stabbed or just whatever. I'm going to be attacked and hurt. Um, and I, I will mention, because um, I am someone that likes to be vulnerable, because I think talking about the good is great, but also talking about the bad um, is also good as well and therapeutic for maybe some people as well. Because of my anxiety, I got to a really bad point in my life where I was dealing with a lot of heart palpitations from the anxiety. And with my OCD, it kind of transformed into this fact where I was obsessing over the fact that I was having heart attacks every day. So every day while I was in college, I would wake up, just do my business, and then I would start getting the heart palpitations from the anxiety. And then I would think I'm having a heart attack. And this went on for months and months. And even when I would go into like emergency walk-ins and they would do EKGs and everything, they would be like, no, you, you're fine. You're, you're not suffering from heart attacks. But it just, you know, I kept feeling like every morning when I wake up, up, oh, this is it. This is the day I die from a heart attack. Um, and just, you know, it just got to a point where it was just becoming too much. You know, the OCD, the anxiety was just like, just this terrible cocktail um mixed together and you know i myself eventually found myself calling my mom one day when i was a sophomore in college and telling her to come get me because if she didn't come get me then there was a high chance that that would be the last time we would ever talk so um yeah ocd has been very crippling for me you know i, I took a lot of time off from school and college to get counseling you know, learn different ways of therapy just to deal with it because it, it truly was making my life a living hell. Um, and I got to a point where because of it, I really just didn't want to be alive. Thank you for, for sharing that. I think what you mentioned about like highlighting the, the good parts and the bad parts are really important, but I think, you know, it, it, it can be especially important I think in in cases like with OCD where it's something that is often so trivialized like I think looking at how like deeply affecting it can be is is really important so I really appreciate you raising that and, and I hope that um you know this might cause people who are watching this now or who watch this um later down the line to like kind of reconsider maybe the language that they use when they talk about this type of thing or, or these types of like issues and behaviors. Um, Katie, yeah, I, I'm oh, sorry. Neat, neat freak. We're, yeah, we're not all just neat freaks. <laughs> yeah. Or, or just, you know, or <laughs> just the idea that it, it actually has like serious consequences and it's not just one of those things where like, Oh, I'm a bit OCD. Like, 
<laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> I'm sure we'll get onto that part <laughs> later. Um, but yeah, Katie, if, if you don't mind talking us through kind of how, what led up to you getting first diagnosed as well, please. Yeah, sure. So as I said before, I was probably around 19 when it started rearing its ugly head. Um, so it was when I went to university. Um, I think the change that happened, in, you know, like the big change of that in my, for my life of starting university probably was the main thing that sparked it off. I think like lot, when there's big change in my life, things do sometimes get a little bit more heated in that area. Um, mm-hmm. So basically... I was trying to settle into university and I was becoming more and more obsessive. Um, It was all in turn. So my type of OCD um, is basically all sort of thought pattern related. So it's all to do, it's all to do with having obsessive thoughts. And then my compulsions are also internal as well. So I think people could tell that I was really depressed and anxious, but they couldn't really tell why um, or see that I was doing any compulsions. Um, So I got diagnosed with anxiety and depression in my first year of uni and went on some medication for that. Um, uh, But basically, I was finding that, um, you know, I was getting a little bit of counselling through the university and things and trying to read books about overcoming depression and anxiety. And I was finding that really it was kind of um, not quite hitting the spot. And the reasons for that, I think, were because I was sort of treating... Um, the anxiety and depression as if that that was the only problem but the stem problem was actually OCD and I didn't realize that yeah so some of the exercises I was doing when I was doing like cognitive behavioral therapy um were you know not didn't really feel like they applied to me all that much like I was struggling a little bit with that um and it wasn't really to be honest you know the all the way through my uni years, I didn't realise I had it. It wasn't really until I was about 23 that I became really bad with it. And I actually took some time off work um, because of it, probably about three months. I think during that time, I'd started talking to my dad a little bit more about the content of my obsessions. And he'd started, to be honest, I think, out of panic and just worrying about his daughter so much, started looking on the OCD Foundation website. Um, and also just generally all over the internet to see what he thought my problem was. He was trying to have some sort of solution focused, you know, what dads are like. (laughs) Um, So he was trying to do that. And I think basically he just came to me with a printout one day from the OCD organization website or foundation website and passed it over to me. was like, hey, read this um, and tell me what you think. So I read this piece of paper that had um, like a type of um, OCD on it. Um, and I was like, oh my God, this is me. This is completely me. And he was like, I know, I was thinking that myself. (laughs) And I was like, oh my God, do I have OCD? Is this what this is? And he was like, I think it is. So I went to the GP and he wasn't actually that helpful because sometimes GPs can be a little bit, basically, they just, obviously they are general practitioners. Like that is what GP stands for. they have a lot of general knowledge about med- med- medicine. Um, and it was a bit of a niche type of OCD. So he was like, oh, I think really the ruminations you're having are just part of your OC- of your anxiety. Not my OCD, sorry. Um, but anyway, I went to see a psychologist. I was really lucky that I could do that. My parents helped me to, do, to see someone professionally about it privately because I think the waiting list was like two years to see someone on the NHS. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I... Um, went to see someone and basically explained what I'd been thinking about and what had been bothering me and how bad it had gotten. And um, basically she was like, yeah, you definitely have OCD. Like you absolutely, this is exactly what you're explaining right now. Um, and that was a huge sort of turnaround for me. He, uh, she, The therapist wrote a letter to my GP explaining that I did have OCD and recommending a specific type of medication at a specific level. So I got that. And also I started like seeing this therapist on a, on a relatively regular basis. Um, not for huge amounts of time, because it was obviously very expensive, but it really <laughs> was such a turning point for me because I think um, having that insight into what was wrong with me really meant I could start treating the, um, the OCD from 
you know, treat my problem from the core, not just mm. the anxiety and depression that was being caused by me having such severe OCD. Because that made a huge difference. And to be honest, I just I have to thank my dad for that because I don't think I would have figured it out on my own. And I'm not sure I would have thought to go to a psychologist and be like, this is what's going on. You know, like I, I had seen a counsellor and they hadn't really figured that out. Um, probably because it is a bit niche and, you know, they didn't know everything that was going on in my head. So, yeah, that was a huge turning point for me. Um, and I've been on medication for it ever since and had a bit of, of um, therapy on and off. And I'm doing much better than I was. Much, much better. Still up and down, but, yeah. yeah. I think. Sorry if that was a bit long winded. No, no, no. <laughs> You're good. No, it, it's good, honestly, it to great. have like the context uh, uh, for everything. And I just, yeah, I'm really glad that you had your dad looking out for you. I know Chotty in chat said <laughs> wholesome dad moment. Um, yeah, shout yeah. Which, out dad. Yeah. Shout out dad. <laughs> um, but that is so nice. And I, I think it's uh, one of the things that you brought up that I think is really like moving. And, and I think probably a lot of people, even those, you know, with other conditions outside of OCD, will be able to relate to is that like finally getting the diagnosis and actually understanding oh this is why my entire life up until this moment has been the way it has been like I not gonna make this about me but just uh, as a thing to relate like when I got my ADHD diagnosis I was like oh like now everything that I've struggled with literally since I was born makes a lot of sense um yeah, yeah I can see that insight is such a huge like I don't think I've ever gotten as bad with my OCD or anxiety or depression since like I've never gone down as far as that since figuring out what's wrong so I think yeah sometimes mm-hmm. diagnosis can be like it can... hugely impactful yeah and even like through like all the, the research around us as well mm. like, yeah I know yeah, it's true. Like, like when I was uh really struggling uh and you know similar to what everyone has said like I was like it's depression it's anxiety I hadn't realized that at this very core was this OCD issue and I think also now that I know what it is and I can understand it but also like my husband understands it now and so like if I am having a particular moment I'm like you know I'm having like OCD is really flaring up he gets it he can understand it he also can like help me deal with it help him deal with it help the kids deal with it and I just think having that diagnosis is beneficial for everyone that Mm -hmm. cares and loves about you as well as yourself yeah I'm sure there's probably a lot of things like that happen that must cause interpersonal relationships to be really like strained or difficult because you know a a lot of people that we've spoken to with, with kind of any condition on panels like this are like I can't explain why I'm doing the things that I'm doing and sometimes it can be quite destructive and it can impact other people and you know impact me very severely which you know it's just this whole like spiral kind of sucking everything into it so being able to yeah like share with other people this is why this is happening or even Katie as you were saying like identify those like patterns of behavior and those thoughts and like understand them better before they happen as they happen like must yeah help to some degree in terms of like mitigating it um but yeah, thank you so much. I can also see that uh, Angelisa in chat says it's so good to seeing this being talked about as I have severe OCD. Um, and thank you for joining us. Um, and yeah, I this is one that I think that Rosie and I were both like really excited about um, because it is something that I, I think neither of us, speaking for Rosie a little bit here, but I think she said it in the chat a minute ago, neither of us knew like a huge amount about OCD going in, but we knew enough about it to understand that like one, it's extremely stigmatized and two, it's a topic that is very much worth exploring and and kind of talking about more to a wider range of people. Um, So yeah, it's, yeah, it's fascinating. And I really appreciate everyone who's kind of sharing their thoughts on this. Um, Mario, I know you kind of spoke to us a little bit earlier about like the process of of getting your diagnosis through like diagnosing like your kid getting uh, his diagnosis. Um, But if you um, if you want to expand on that anymore and kind of talk to us a little bit more about what led up to your diagnosis or like how that actual diagnosis process happened, um, then please feel free. Yeah, I'll say I'm glad I went last here um, because this this experience of hearing, you know, the three of you guys talk before me is really similar to what I've done for the past couple of years, which is hear something and say that that really is me. And um, I hope, first of all, I hope that, that like anyone who, who ends up listening gets that same takeaway. Like 
you know, it's so easy to pin something on on anything to, to make an excuse for it, whether it is mental health or even if it's, even if it's not, even if it's just something that you can kind of chalk up to, um, you know, something you would never have thought. So like Victoria said about like, kind of like guessing the color of the car, I would have never thought that was in any way tied to OCD or even anxiety. I would have thought that was, you know, used a really good phrase bargaining with yourself. Like in a, in a positive way, there are certainly times in the past you know, couple decades where it's like, Oh, if I could, if I could, you know, guess this, guess the color of this car, like the next few minutes are going to be fine. And that's not saying the flip side is the opposite. Like if I don't get it right, it's going to be bad. There's not always, there's not always a negative thing to it um, in like the innocent, naive approach to it, but not even realizing until you said it today that that, that has any tie to mental health as opposed to just being something I think is important. And, um, you know, I, I know like, uh, I, I say all the time, like, you don't know what you don't know. Mm. So you don't even think, you don't even think to ask the question. You don't even think to tie it together. And like, you can go through your life. I always said I was a superstitious person. I am a superstitious person. I knock on wood if I say something that I think is going to be jinxed. Um, there is a, there is probably a level of that that is truly innocent and probably doesn't lead to anything more than knock on wood and you feel a little better. But there is some tie to something underlying that that does matter, that you just kind of feel, um, if I don't do that, it's a negative thing, even if it's the mm -hmm. slightest bit negative. So honestly, I said it before, like I'm very new to the officially knowing it about myself and have all these years of experience of seeing it in, in other people and myself and just somehow not connecting the dots. So um, even just hearing it from you guys is another like, additional, you know, kind of strength to tie it together. Um, so yeah, so my, I, like I said, I gave you how I got there, but my, um, my path apparently is still growing. Like as I, as I hear everyone say something, I'm like, oh, that's another, that's another explanation to it. Uh, and mm -hmm. I will say this cause Chad brought this up too. Um, and Katie with going to the doctor, I forgot about this until you both said it like three years ago, maybe two years ago, I went to a doctor with just this random stomach pain. And I was like, yeah, I want to make sure I didn't have, I don't know, I have no idea, a, a burst uh, appendix, a hernia, I, I don't know, I'm very not medically inclined. <laughs> and the doctor looked at me and she was like, you, you probably need to see somebody else. I was like, what do you mean? You're, you're, the, you're the GP, you're the answer to this. <laughs> uh, and she was like, it's, it's probably uh, a mental health thing. I was like, well, I feel it in my stomach. <laughs> okay. Usually, usually the first place you feel, if you're ever going to feel something is actually in your abdomen. And, um, you know, it, it very well could be a, a sign of mental health. So again, being so naive that I'm sitting in a doctor's office being told what to do. And I'm like, ah, that's, it can't be it. That's, 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 it's unrelated. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And then later learning that I actually went back to her a year later and been, and said to her, you were right. Um, I, ha I have the same pain again. Like, please convince me again that it's not a hernia or a burst of pain. <laughs> 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 like, it's still the mental health thing that you haven't gotten checked out so please go do that um yeah so yeah again it's it's it really is kind of an ongoing process of um hearing things and learning that hey that is something that's something real and that's 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 where i am when i say where, where i am now i mean like literally today too yeah hearing from you guys so yeah. But you find it amazing how much mental health can actually have ramifications on your physical self it's as well. Mad, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's even things crazy. like you could have a bit of IBS and like if you if your mental health's worse and you're feeling like stressy and anxious, um, mm. it, your IBS gets worse. Yeah. You know? Like it's just yeah. things like Well, that. like the number of people who like yeah think they're having a heart attack or think that they're like actively well, like dying but they're yeah. having a panic attack. Yeah. Like it's just yeah. Uh -huh. It is wild yeah. and that's why, yeah, talking about it matters so much. But also just, I think, the, the kind of way that we've moved forward in terms of, like, scientifically understanding these things. Like, I don't, I correct me if I'm wrong, um, but I don't think that OCD is, like, currently considered a neurodivergence, but it is, like, being looked at to be, like, put into that group of conditions, I believe. Um, I didn't know that. But... I, I heard it in a training session, I think, like, six months ago. Um, Chad, your camera's gone. That might be on purpose, but you're fine. I just wanted to make you aware. 
Um, oh, it's, it's come back somewhere else now. Yeah. <laughs> Look at this. Yeah. <laughs> um, my one rubbish camera. In my life. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm like, I need, I need my other. I need another camera to be able to look to, like I'm in the office or something. Yeah. Um, no, I, I, yeah, I just think that it's, it's really interesting how we're starting to learn more about these things and how we thought, you know, previously, like two types of conditions couldn't be comorbid or like, a, you know, one gender of person like couldn't have a certain condition and like all of this stuff that we're now learning more about like will hopefully lead to you know more people having these realizations about themselves but also like something that that came to my mind while you were talking Mario was just about like how you know I think all of you have kind of said th this where you spend so much time like living with this stuff happening in your head and you're just like, oh, that's just one of my quirks. That's just like, that's just me who I am, like as an individual human rather than me with this like actual condition. Um, and I think that that kind of contributes to a lot of people like not wanting to talk about it because it can be like, I don't know, like it can be embarrassing to say like, oh, I think that this thing is going to happen that, that when you say it out loud, it does sound quite silly. Um, and that's how other people will perceive it, right? So you just get that like kind of, I mean, that's how the stigma forms really. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. We've had a couple of uh, comments in chat. So Angelise said the same person from before said, um, it's still hugely stigmatized uh, and telling people I have OCD, they just don't understand as they have their own preconceptions. Uh, my OCD is intrusive thoughts and it is something that I thought was normal until I was diagnosed in my mid twenties. And you are correct. The diagnosis provides clear insights into how you feel and move forward. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, we also have I've Scotland, uh, one of our ambassadors who said, hey everyone, hope we're all having a good day. Rosie has shared some resources um, and an article around OCD that we published this month um, in the chat. And then we also have Wonderpus Gospel uh, said, it is already it is already part of neurodivergence. I do a lot of talks on neurodiversity and the differences in brain function. Cool. I think, yeah, like that's, you know, yes. another thing where like, even this training that I did, it was either in like December or January. On the presentation, there was this like, circle and, and all of the segments of the circle were like different neurodivergences and there's just stuff that I didn't know like I, I didn't know that dyslexia was a neurodivergence and I didn't know that dyslexia could be more than like finding spelling quite difficult and even that is something that is so common like we've been talking about dyslexia since I was like an, an infant like and probably longer than that like how could I still <coughs> this year not know about it um but yeah, it is fascinating, really. Um, so the next question that I want to move into, I'm going to switch up the order as well um, now, so I won't ask you all in the same order every time. Um, <laughs> but the, the next question that I really want to kind of talk about is how does your OCD impact you on a day-to-day -day basis? Because um, I think that's something that, that's really worth kind of shedding some light on as well. Um, Katie, we'll go with you first for this one, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Sorry, I've just forgotten to swallow for a while. So just let me do that. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes when I'm listening too closely to something, I just forget to swallow. It's very weird. Um, <laughs> yeah, so affecting me on a day-to-day -day basis. So I would say, first of all, that it varies quite a lot. Um, and it can vary. Um, I've only recently, sorry, probably in the last like year or so, noticed that it actually... Um, kind of comes along with my like menstrual cycle quite a bit as well like when I my PMS isn't so great my OCD gets much worse on those days so I have like quite a few like not very good days around my period um where my OCD's flared up and I think that's just generally I'm in a probably a worse mood generally or my hormones are all over the place and that'll just make you know I won't be feeling so great so I'll probably be doing a lot more of my compulsions um and things like that and being a bit more obsessive so I definitely find that is the case I would say um when it's been at its worst it has been crippling I haven't been able to focus on anything my memory is like a sieve I feel very anxious sometimes when is that I was at my very worst with it and I was off work with it it was like the minute you opened your eyes before you'd even had a chance to have an obsessive thought you already felt this guttural mm um almost freezing of anxiety and I was like I haven't even had a thought yet how can my body already be telling me I'm this anxious um but um on the day-to-day -day now um what 
13 years on from when I first started getting it. Um, I would say it's up and down in terms of sometimes it does affect my focus, um, particularly at work, I would say. I don't know if you, um, if anyone else has that, but sometimes it, I can make little mistakes at work or just struggle to focus on things. Um, I can, throughout the day, my mood can kind of go up and down a bit because I can sometimes get triggered by something and that sets off like a bit of a spiral of compulsions. Um, I'll say that's that's generally it. Um, and yes, the forgetfulness, it really does make me very forgetful when it's bad. My memory is atrocious. It's almost like I'm senile or something. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that's um, that's how it is. But basically it it, it is, I'm, I think I would say I'm lucky now in comparison to how I was before in that I, for the most part, manage it fairly well now. Um, it doesn't, it does affect my life every single day and the thoughts are always there in the background. Um, but I've found coping mechanisms, I think, where, mm. although I definitely have my bad days, don't get me wrong, um, it's not anywhere near as severe as what it once was. So I'm very thankful for that. <laughs> yeah, thank you for sharing. I do, yeah, I think it's fascinating what you said about it being uh, like, you know, in some ways linked to your menstrual cycle. Um, I hadn't really considered that before, but it does make a lot of sense. Um, but yeah, that's Those really hormones interesting. Those a lot to answer for. Oh my <laughs> God, it's like a storm. Like, guys. <laughs> It's like a storm up in there. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking up and where? Be quiet. <laughs> Oops, sorry. Um, no, you're fine, you're fine. I have had a good panel if someone hasn't snorted at some <laughs> Right. <laughs> Um, Mario, I, I'll, I'll pick on you next if that's okay. Oh, that's uh, a tough one to follow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I will say, first of all, no menstrual cycle to tie it to for me. Um, but I definitely noticed that it is when when I'm more nervous about things. And I will say when I don't even know that I'm nervous about things, when I forgot that I was nervous about things, it definitely flares up more. Um, and like a really good example is I never put it together until recently, but like Sunday nights, I feel more anxious than a Thursday night. Um, and it's obviously, you know, the beginning of the work week coming up, the beginning of my kid's school week. Um, so just just the moments when it, it doesn't I'm very lucky like when I'm busy and maybe I say lucky, maybe this is common when I'm busy and I'm really uh, distracted and I'm into something. I don't really have time for a, a free thought. You know, there are so many there's so many racing thoughts filling my mind that, you know, I always say when, when I'm. I coach my kids and I love coaching. And when I'm coaching, like I, I don't have another thought other than the thousands of things that are going into that moment to get the kids to improve their game. Um, but then when it stops and when it's, when it's that break, what I found is if there's something that I almost forgot to be upset about, it comes back in and it's like, Hey, you know, you don't forget you were upset about something. Uh, you know, and I'm like, well, what, what? I'm almost bargaining with myself. What was it? I, I, I had moved past it enough that I'm not even thinking about it. And yet I have the feeling that I have to, I have to kind of, let's say, pay the piper for something that did make me upset earlier. And like, that's probably the, the, the biggest impact on a daily life is, is the change from not even, not even thinking about anything, just being truly in the moment to having to step out of it and then almost having things catch up with you. Um, and go through the process of can I move past this one, this one, this one? Um, and thankfully, yes, you know, there, as Katie said, there are coping mechanisms that sometimes I don't even know if I'm doing, and it's just, you know, you survive it, right? You just move to the next one. Um, but I would say that that's, that's the, the kind of wave of being totally fine because you're absorbed in something to just having it resurface out of nowhere. Um, where it's almost like, boy, I wish I can go back to the past 10 minutes where I was deeply involved in mm. something and not thinking about it. Yeah. 
Oh yeah, thank God, you. Mario, I just wanted to be like, 100%! 100%! <laughs> and, and it's like, don't say anything, Katie. Don't interrupt him! <laughs> it would have been fine. Uh, but I was just like, oh my God, I'm the same, oh my God. I just felt like, yeah, like everything you said. Oh, 100% get you. Yeah, you articulate, articulated that so amazingly. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I think that you made some really good points. Uh, and also, uh, I'm going to pronounce this Kairi Electra. Uh, in chat said this is really great to listen to um so yeah thank you all again for for sharing how how yeah you're experiencing ocd um chad we'll go with you next if that's okay if you don't mind giving us a day-to-day kind of rundown i guess yeah so it's kind of funny because i was thinking here and i was trying not to laugh because i was just thinking like in terms of my day-to-day life like how does ocd affect me and then, funny enough, it affects my. If <laughs> it affects when I eat, um, so I get into a pattern. So I wake my dog, or my dog wakes me up. I should say, <laughs> he wakes me up every morning at six a.m. to feed him, and that's when I eat breakfast. I then feed him half of his second cup that he gets every day, at eleven a.m. That's when I eat lunch. And then I give him his final half of a cup at 6 p.m. That's when I eat dinner. And I do that every day. And I've been doing that for, like, the last five years. And I just now, as I was, like, reading over the questions, you know, leading up to this panel, I'm like, oh, my God, that is such, like, a compulsion for me. Like, I literally don't ever break that that pattern. And when I do, I get upset. It's like, that's not what I'm supposed to be eating. I should have been already mm. been eating have ate my lunch or this is way past the time I should have ate lunch and then I get grumpy and I'm upset because I'm like I should be eating <laughs> <laughs> so it's like I was just like sitting here thinking like wow it even just affects like my routine in my day it's like I've got to eat at certain times because I'm being compelled to do so just subconsciously not even thinking about it and I totally you know agree and just uh, you know, with what you said, Mario, like I a hundred percent the same way. Like when I'm doing something, I, it just, you know, even if I, I have a thought in my head and it's just trying to, you know, tell me I'm not good enough or, you know, tell me I should be doing something else. It's like, that goes away. Um, and it's funny enough because growing up, I hated public speaking. I was a very shy person. Um, so to now be doing so much public speaking, um, leading up to when I do a speech, I'm so obsessive. I'm just like, oh my god, you gotta prepare um, three times a day. You have to do 30 minutes at least of your speech every uh, you know, every time. All this, all this. Make sure you articulate this. You know, put more emphasis here, reflection here. And then I get to the, the speech. I do the speech and then I'm just like, in the mi- even in the middle of me speaking, doing my speech, I'm like, why was I worried? I got this. I'm doing great. But then the second I'm done with the speech, I'm like, oh, my God, I think I said this wrong. I didn't do that right. Um, Why didn't you prepare more? You should have prepared more. Uh, So it's just like in the middle of it, I'm just like, I'm fine. I've got this. And the second I'm done, I'm like, oh, my God, you are just a terrible person. How how did you mess up the first word of your speech? (laughs) Just, Just stuff like that. And, you know, I always check my emails the same time every day. Um... You know, just just these actions, you know, I just like I have these routines that I have to do and I have to stay in them. And a lot of times I do them subconsciously and I don't even think about them being a part of my OCD. It's like, oh, it's just me living my life. But, you know, when I really sit back and actually reflect, it's like, no, this is your OCD. This is you setting to a pattern. You're compelled to do it. You have an obsession to be compelled to do these things every day. You just don't sit down and think about it all the time like you used to because back when I was younger in college uh, my goodness I, I would just think on these things and I would just let them fester and it would affect my you know personal relationships with my parents because when I had an obsessive thought I would call them and say oh my god mom I think I have cancer and she's like you do not have cancer I'm like yes I do I have cancer she's like no you do not have cancer if you had cancer it would have shut on the blood work that you just did yesterday it didn't show up, so you don't have cancer. And just, she eventually got to a point where she really wanted to stop talking to me for a long time. She's just like, I don't want to talk to you. If all you're going to talk about are these intrusive thoughts, I'm not going to deal, you know, deal with you. And 
that's not to say, oh, what a bad mother. It's just like, no. It's like she was trying to be supportive and, you know, get me out of this, you know, these ruts and these thoughts and just these just demonizing voices. And I had to put in the work myself. And it wasn't until I started putting in the work myself, realizing, okay, this is my OCD. It's triggered with my anxiety because it does get triggered with my anxiety. When I'm more anxious, I get OCD super bad. Um, and it's until I finally started working on it on my own instead of like trying to put it on on everybody else but myself. That's when I started finally seeing improvements. And yes, I still have ups and downs with it, but I'm so much better at managing it, um, whether it be through some types of medication or just my own cognitive mental gymnastics and exercises that I do. So I don't know. Hopefully that answers the question. I kind of rambled there a little bit. No, I, I, I think you answered it well. It was right. great. Yeah. yeah. Mental gymnastics is such a good phrase. I'm borrowing that. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think you... know a lot about mental gymnastics, isn't <laughs> <laughs> I think you raised Gold some medals, really maybe. interesting points. I think, like, firstly, the, the, like... I'm trying to think of the right word. Like, the quite extreme or quite intense reaction to, like, a routine being broken um, mm. is is an interesting one um and then yeah like what you said about how e like even in relationships where someone is trying to be supportive like it it can be difficult to know what to do uh, and it can be difficult probably as well to be hearing those thoughts like I know obviously like you've got them in your head all the time but it can be difficult for other people as well to have those like repeatedly verbalized at them I guess is what I'm trying to say um I think oh, that's a really yeah. I'm really glad that you raised that and I think that's a really interesting point um Victoria I think we've got you next but I'm just going to read out this message from chat that we got um it, it's from Lloyd Jones and they said a big part of my OCD focuses on other perceptions of me ultimately if I can make a mental link to something then so can other people which means that they have that and and they will um, it meant that I always watched what I said and who, mm. and who I said it to because I always operate under the assumption that it will come back to me. Um, mm. It meant that I found it hard to come out to people as trans because I always I was always terrified that someone would connect the dots in a way which meant that, like it was just a matter of time until it came back to me. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. Thank you for sharing that. Um, that's a really great comment. Yeah, that's a great comment, and congratulations on coming as to friends. That's yeah, I'm so yeah, glad absolutely. that you found that. Super congrats. Uh, able to do it. That's a great step. Yeah, um, yeah. Vic Victoria, do you mind uh, kind of telling us about what your um, experiences of OCD on a day to day? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think I, I I won't repeat too much what other people have said, but mm. so much of what everyone has said does ring true. Um, I mean, OCD for me is something that I am incredibly self aware of every single day. And there are times where I have to kind of almost like logically take a step back from myself and be like, this is your OCD. You need to like rein it, not rein it in, but then like I have to have that self-awareness sometimes because I'm very conscious of like, I'll be, you know, as you guys have said, so sort of spiraling into this pattern. And then I almost have to slightly remove myself from it and kind of bring myself back to the present and be like, no, no, this is OCD. You are in control. This is, you know, you can, you've got this. Um, but like every day there is something and, you know, as you guys have mentioned, it, it, you know, it varies from time to time. There are days where like it's, it's kind of humming along in the background. There are other days where it's like right at the forefront and it's very intense. Uh, I obviously, like I said, take medication, but you know, with having OCD, I'm also very particular when I take the medication to the point that <laughs> even though I know that this is not good for me, logically, if I don't take my medication at a certain time in the day, I don't want to take it later because that's not my routine. Even though oh I know goodness. I should just take, even though I know I should just take the medication because it's helping me, I also don't want to because that's not when I should take the medication. And mm -hmm. it's just like weird things like this which just trip me up, I suppose sometimes. Um, generally speaking, like I I do take my medication very well. I'm a good girl. Uh, but yeah, there are days where I've missed it because it's not part of my routine, and if it 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 doesn't fit in in the afternoon, as far as I'm concerned, and yeah. that is almost slightly backwards and going forwards. But that's how it happens um there are also other times you know and again i i won't repeat too much but like you said like if i'm really like focused on like if i've been doing like a really good interview for work or something and i get really like i can become really obsessive of the um of the interview which is actually quite beneficial it means i can get it done and i get really into it but then when it stops i'm done 
rather than having this wonderful moment of relief where I've done a good job, I'm suddenly just like, boom, what's next? And it's like, oh, there, there's the OCD, it's still there, kind of thing. And then it does take me sometimes, you know, again, sometimes it can take, like be very physically draining and like I will suddenly just be like I am exhausted from these thoughts and these feelings and I just have to sort of you know like tell my husband and my kids like I've, I've got to have some space I need to go and lie down um and luckily I, I'm very lucky that I have a wonderful support system here and they get it um but there are some times where I do just have to completely step back and be like guys I just I, OC is happening I need to step back and that is something that I do deal with not day to day but it's definitely something that is always I'm aware of in my day to day life yeah yeah thank you I think you summarized something really well that like I noticed was there in like what everyone had said so far and that it's this thing where you know you're saying you've got these coping mechanisms these medications these things in place but it's like it's like a constant thing right like you're not the medication the diagnosis the whatever doesn't just make it go away and that it's something that you're Mm. always thinking about managing um and yeah I think that that's something that it's really important for people to be like aware mm-hmm. of and understand and yeah like I, like you said like it being something that you don't want to be constantly bringing up but it's also something that is like actually constantly there so it does need bringing up yeah. like um, you never get any holiday days when you've got OCD yeah right That's your mental job yeah. Yeah. yeah, it it don't it don't go away during Thanksgiving, Halloween, <laughs> Christmas, yeah. Easter. It's like I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's the first person to wish me happy birthday tomorrow morning. <laughs> yep. Um, we will have to get in at midnight and quickly. Yeah, message. we'll be there. Try um, beat your OCD at it. Yeah. Um, I think that's also like. Um, sorry, just to say, I think. What, what really like everyone has kind of summarized is is how like OCD also kind of finds any gap in your life and fills it like yeah so like if you you know like Mario was saying when he's coaching his boys and when he's finished once he relax you know relaxes from that and he's maybe in his car driving home or whatever it just comes it comes back to you slowly um, and you might be dealing with it really, really well and feeling great, and then it'll just slip mm-hmm. back in there. It'll just slip back in. Uh, See, yeah, I always listen to like worst. podcasts when I go to bed because I don't want those intrusive thoughts. Like it's, it's, I can't, I don't have peace generally. Like if I'm having a moment of relaxing, mm-hmm. I need to have something that will be helping fill that void so OCD doesn't. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I love that you just said that because that is so me. Like, if I just try to go to sleep all those thoughts i'm thinking of everything and i i'll just put some music on i'll watch a youtube video and just have it on loop oh my goodness yes that's 100 percent me <laughs> yeah it's one of those things like yeah something that to a degree like i experienced from having adhd as well it's like imagine just like having a quiet minute in your head like i what is that like i just to, like? to be able to yeah like like chad said like go to sleep and not have all of these things suddenly rushing to the forefront and like it's exhausting to like constantly have your brain switched on um but yeah i have to take so many naps i don't know but i take a lot of naps i'm I'm a napper (laughs) i just i don't here as well i say this to to rosie all the time but i like don't have a sleep schedule i just you know I'll, I'll sleep for like periods of time like maybe I'll sleep from 7 p.m to midnight then I'll be up for like several hours and then I'll sleep for another couple and like I just I just you know that's what people used to do back in the day oh. I, in the UK anyway like people used to used to wake up in the middle of the night have a bit of a gossip and a cup of tea <laughs> Do oh, around should, a bit and then go back to bed. We should it bring it like, back because yeah, then I'm not like, lonely when yeah. I'm awake at like three o'clock <laughs> oh, in the morning. Yeah, I, <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I, don't, I don't know. You don't want to be waking me up in the middle of the night. <laughs> <laughs> I would not be happy with you. <laughs> Reasonable. Um, Chad, you cup up. Like, absolutely not. Get out of my face. <laughs> um. So in the interest of time, I'm going to kind of truncate these next two questions into one question. Um, but, but that one question is, have you ever had issues in the workplace as a result of your OCD? And then what could those workplaces kind of do to better support 
you know, either yourselves or people who, or anyone who has OCD, basically. Um, Chad, I'll go with you first for this one, if that's okay. Yeah. Who? Ah, oh, man, that's a that's a tricky one there because yeah. in terms of like, what can they do? I mean, that's the hard one. That's the hard one to to give an answer for because it's like you can give them understanding and awareness, but then it's kind of up to them to understand how truly debilitating that OCD is and that's right. you know the big thing that there's a lot of misunderstanding around is they just they don't think it's as debilitating as of course we've all discussed it has been and is mm. um, so for me I used to work um, at a guide dog school um, obviously of course uh, I have a guide dog he, you might be able to see him in the background because he's being very active right now um, but I I always got into this pattern because obviously before I was a philanthropist, I was like a front desk person. So I did all the mail. I did phone calls. Uh, I took packages in. And this is something that now when I, I look back and reflect on like, oh yeah, that was totally my OCD in play. I would always just get up so many times during my day at the front desk to go check the mail boxes that were hmm. um, for we had we had the downstairs and we had upstairs and the downstairs was for like all the other offices to come in and then the upstairs was kind of for like the vps the managers and the ceo so every now and again like it could be like 30 minutes or an hour i'd get up to go check it and i didn't have to because i could have just been like oh, i'll check it at least three hours from now but they know like routines like every hour on the dot i was up going to check the mail and i'll never forget that I went to do my whole routine because I had the obsessive thought, like, I should go check the mail. So then obviously I'm going to go check the mail because that's what I got to go do. I got to go check the mail now. And I come back and God bless her. My, one of my volunteers, I didn't, you know, I didn't understand this because I didn't have context at the time, but she was kind of like yelling at one of the other employees that was part of the um, janitorial staff because they were playing with Andros. <laughs> um, I kind of was like, why are you yelling at her? You shouldn't be yelling at the this employee, blah, blah, blah. But I didn't have the under, um, the context that that employee was kind of being unprofessional in front of guests. So then I ended up looking like in a total jerk of an employee because I'm yelling at a volunteer when she's trying to make it to where, hey, we have guests. We should be acting a lot more professional here to this other employee. Um, and I ended up getting written up for it. Um, obviously, of course, you know, did I deserve it? Yeah, I probably did. You know, I was being rude on it, you know, unprofessional my, myself, but I didn't have the context of it. And when I reflect back on it, you know, it kind of stemmed from my OCD. And I think that's something that the managers at uh, Southeastern didn't understand with me as an employee is OCD and how debilitating um, how um, truly conflicting it was with my jobs and my task. And I think they just thought I was becoming a bad employee or I was just a rude person or I didn't have any sort of like social awareness when in reality it was the OCD. Um, and I really try to like stress to them, like, you know, this is what's going on. And I just don't think they really had a good grasp or understanding of motor diversity. Um, uh, and neurodiversity. So um, it was hard for me to kind of express myself and try to be understood there. And, you know, eventually the pandemic happened and I was let go. But when I look back, there's like, there's so much kind of regret I have because I feel like I was truly almost in a sense targeted because of my OCD. And I wish I could have gone back and, you know, spoken up for myself a lot more and really tried to advocate myself better when it came to my OCD. Oh, is Sky? Yeah, nailed it. Nailed it. I was like, wow. Um, yeah, no. Um, no, I was just saying it's interesting that, like, um, that you mentioned about, you know, a job where you have, like, guests or customers or whatever, because, like, I hadn't considered it too much, I think, in the context you can't of explain it to everyone, can you? Like the minute they walk. Yeah, <laughs> well, and also like a type of job. Like I'm thinking back on like my previous jobs now, and and trying to kind of 
like picture what you all are saying like in that context and a job where you're like you have to be at a register or you have to be at a specific station all the time and you know what if you then yeah need to go off and do something that you know your, your head is telling you that you need to do um and yeah it must be difficult but yeah I mean hopefully this kind of thing and like the more awareness and understanding like you said Chad will will help other people in the future um but uh yeah victoria can i ask you the the same question about kind of your workplace experiences and, and any recommendations you have yeah i mean i should say that i've been incredibly lucky um i actually only started working a little over two years ago um and in that time like when i started working i was very aware of my ocd and i've always been an advocate for people with you know any mental health condition mm -hmm. so straight off the bat like i've never tried to hide the ocd my employees and my colleagues will know I have OCD and so if there ever has been a moment where I need to take a step back that has not been a problem and I'm very very grateful for them for that um, one thing I think that I would possibly say is I you, in terms of what people can do better in the workplace is I, I do feel that you know what we're doing now for example like talking about it is so important to try and get that education so people can actually understand that this isn't just like oh it's Victoria being a little bit of a weird like you know tick this is actually something that is a compulsion and it's very very real to me of the person who is going through this and I think if we can help people have that understanding that it's not just a sort of funny whim that this is actually something that is very deeply like rooted in their being and it affects them mentally physically I think that is would be a huge step towards having more support generally across you know the gaming industry or any industry um again like i said for me i've never actually experienced any uh conflict or issue because of my ocd i don't know if that's luck of the draw or because i talk about it more or what but i think the more that i talk about it the more my colleagues understand the more they appreciate what it is like to be in this situation so it's probably not a very exciting answer. It's not a very juicy answer. <laughs> no, I, I, but I, I, I think it's very important again that we just make sure that we can educate and yeah. hopefully the people that we're trying to get this message across to are receptive to it and can take it on board. Yeah, well, I think it's. I mean, it, I think it's a good answer because it's not like you know a question that that I'm kind of posing with the expectation that you'll be like, well, this is exactly what every company needs to do. Like this is all of the processes they need to because it it. It will vary, one, based on the company, um, two, based on the individual who has OCD, because even like with the four of you here, we've seen, you know, some, some quite different experiences in the same way that we've seen some quite similar experiences. Um, but yeah, that's why like the education is so important. And um, what you mentioned about the fact that you you're pretty good at like communicating it and something that I'm like so passionate about so like my role at safe in our world is that i run our level up mental health program so i help games industry companies with like being better in terms of like mental health practices and how they deal with that kind of stuff um and one of the things that is like so important is like disclosure and actually understanding what accommodations that person might need um and you know different workplaces will call it different things whether it's like a disability passport whether it's just done in like a more informal one-to-one -one type of thing um but like being able to be up front and be like hey like this is my condition this is what types of things i might need to do and therefore the types of like accommodations I might need and, and whether that's stuff that is like you know gonna be in place all of the time um so I don't know I can't think of an example that applies to like generally all workplaces but let's say if it's a place where you have like meetings and appointments it might be okay well I might probably need a bit of time between each meeting I can't really do stuff back to back maybe that's an example and then there'll be stuff that is more kind of as and when like if I'm having a really bad time with it um I might need these things to be in place and like one of the things that I talk about like all the time and that I just really want people to like get their heads around is like flexibility and just there's not one answer to be like we've put this in place and now everyone who has OCD is going to have a good time in our workplace like you have to be flexible with the individual you have to be flexible with like how within that individual like the things that are happening as a result of OCD are going to be different on like a day-to-day -day basis on a week-to-week -week basis year-to-year whatever 
Um, so yeah, no, I think you raised some really good points. Thank you. Um, Mario, would you like to, to talk to us next about kind of workplace stuff? Yeah, and I will say Victoria had an answer I would have basically copy and pasted if I could. It was, it was <laughs> no. exactly because um, it's it's not always negative. And I think that what she said that I would have said as well is like just just speaking up about it and being, um, you know, I, I always say like I wear my heart on my sleeve. Uh, you know, you kind of know what you get when, when you're talking with me. And I think that's important because you don't it sounds crazy, but you're you may get you may get judged by what you have. But you're very rarely going to be told right back, like immediately in that moment, right back in your face, like, well, no, that isn't real or that isn't serious. You're probably going to get a question or you're probably going to get, you know, maybe some, especially if it's OCD, you're going to get someone saying something like, well, isn't that, you know, isn't that just being neat? And it kind of opens the door to give another, um, to like have one more, you know, level of communication where you're just saying, no, it's actually this. And it's really hard for people to hear that and then be a jerk in response. You know, in the moment, they're asking a question because they're trying to clarify it. Um, so I found that in, in terms of in terms of work stuff, and again, this is for someone who didn't even know that it was OCD, just saying like, hey, it, this this thing's this thing's bothering me, or this thing is you know something that's on my mind. I need to do this, or I need to just talk about it. It's very hard for people to say no to that. That's that's a very human interaction. Um, but I will say that the other side of it is the there's a the non-human part like there's a level of perfectionism that also goes with with having OCD where where something it doesn't have to be a piece of work but something just isn't right it just doesn't feel right it isn't working right um, and what I found is and I like this this is gonna sound crazy I've never missed a deadline because if you give me a deadline that's part of the OCD like strength it's like okay so my my um you know my my obsession is to make sure it's it's written and published by midnight tonight okay it's gonna happen but at the same time uh having the deadline means that i in this sky this goes to what you were saying like i have the flexibility to do it how i need to when i need to and whatever resources i need it's my responsibility to do but i can do it mm. so it's it's almost you know it's a, it's very much like the education of what goes into it but also like okay I'm going to, if, if I were, if I were, you know, which I have like essentially running a, a team that has to produce something, do whatever you need to do. As long as it's done by five o'clock Friday. What, you know, if you tell me that you need to do this because of something mental health, I, I get it. I acknowledge it and I'm fine with it. You just have the responsibility on the back end, and whatever you need to do it, you have the freedom to do it. So it's, it's that like that trade off of, um, understanding, but also responsibility. It's like, I found that if those two work together, it works really, really well together. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Like, I think one of the things that I've noticed a lot that happens often in not so great workplaces is that lack of like trust or lack of willingness to let someone do a task how they want to do it. Um, you know, it's something that we did a neurodiversity panel like a few months back and it's something that came up quite a lot there of just like, I probably won't work as well as other people during the same times or in the same structure as, as how they work best um, or as how like neurotypical people work best. Um, and so, yeah, like companies that are, are happy to say like, this is the outcome I need and this is when I need it by, but anything that happens in between, like that's up to you, I think is a really good way that you can show like, one, trust, which is a huge thing in like workplace satisfaction and stuff, but also support to that person being able to work around their own accommodations that they might need to put in place. Um, yeah, it's a little bit like that expression, like you don't change the flower, you change the environment. It's about finding oh, what works for the person. I heard that before, that's cool. Yeah, that's cool. so it's not like you wouldn't chuck the plant out, you would just maybe like change it because it needs more light or something. Yeah. Like, you just find what works to make that flourish and bloom. And that's what you need to do for an individual as well. Yeah, that's a really good way to phrase it. Thank you for that. That's another one that I'll like squirrel away for when I need it later. Um, yeah, Katie, uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about your experience of OCD and work? Yeah, so um, I suppose I alluded to it to begin with that I've had to take like a break from work because of it. Um, 
I think I only had to do that once. Um, thankfully, well, maybe thankfully, maybe not thankfully. Um, it was at the start of my career and I was a temp at the time. So I actually just had to leave um, in order to take that break. Um, so I wasn't paid. I think I was very lucky that I was in a position where I could just stay at home rent free while I was getting better. Uh, not everybody has that privilege. Um, so yeah, it's affected me in that sense that my anxiety and, and became so bad that it made me depressed. Um, and then I was off work. And I think um, in line with what, you know, sort of Victoria and Mario were saying about how they're very open with their managers about it. At that time, I wasn't willing to tell anyone about what, what was wrong. I wasn't willing to tell anyone I had a mental health problem. Um, I do think like the world has changed a lot <laughs> um, since I was in my early 20s, thankfully, um, and people are a lot more open about it and that's only a positive thing. But at the time, my mum was like, you don't want to tell your temping agency that you've got a mental health problem because they probably won't give you work in future because they'll think you're unreliable. Um, so I had to just say I had some personal stuff come up and I needed some time off for that. Um, they probably guessed what was wrong, but um, I think they were really worried that something had happened in the office that I wasn't willing to say. So that worried them as well. And um, it, it could have been so much more simple if I was just willing to express it. And they would have been, they probably would have been absolutely fine with it. I hope, I hope they would have been. Um, but then more recently, um, not while I've been working for Ubisoft, um, but when I worked at uh, Newcastle Uni um, beforehand, um, I got into a little bit of trouble with my manager because I was making little mistakes with my work and she was um I was an admin and she was quite um like quite a perfectionist herself I think and like some of that kind of got pushed onto some of her staff as well like I don't think she meant it in a bad way but you know I think she wasn't as forgiving of like little mistakes as like my managers have had since um but my OCD had gotten pretty bad at work and I hadn't ever explained that to her and I think had I done that earlier she wouldn't have gotten so annoyed about it and sort of progressed with like having meetings with me about it and like threatened disciplinary stuff because she would have understood that I, I would have just said I'm really sorry my focus is a bit off at the minute I'm working on getting better so it should improve like you know like I don't want to use it as an excuse mm -hmm. um but equally at the time it was really quite bad and I wasn't honest with her that, about that what was happening maybe not fully willing to admit to myself how bad it had gotten again so I think that is isn't great and I've never had a, an issue since I've certainly not have ever had an issue at Ubisoft but I think um as well even if I did um I'm now better at letting my managers know when things are kind of going downhill a little bit with my OCD um, and I know you know within the last six months I've had a conversation with my current manager and bringing you know coming on to what you say what you asked about what would be a good thing for managers and workplace to put in place um, she just I told her I was like I just want to let you know that I'm feeling a bit forgetful at the minute and I'm, I've noticed my focus is a little bit off and I really don't want it to affect my work and I'm trying my absolute best for it to not but my OCD is quite spiking it's basically spiking at the minute and it is kind of affecting me a little bit and I'm trying my absolute best but um I'm just worried in case you notice anything and she was like, what can I, what can I do? Like, is there anything I can do to help? And I just said, like, if you can just be a little bit patient with me at the minute, if I do make little mistakes that I don't usually make because um, I'm a bit, you know, distracted and struggling to focus on my work and that I might just need um, one or two, like maybe one extra day working from home a week if I wake up in the morning and I'm feeling really anxious and I just feel like I might, be more productive at home that day um and she was great about it and to be honest I honestly in a sense I'm not sure that a workplace can do anything more than ask the individual what mm -hmm. will help what can I do to help is there anything I can do to help and nothing ever came up I think I'm because of what happened at the university I'm nervous now uh, I'm very nervous about people perceiving that I'm making more mistakes and things because of it yeah. And I am a lot more open about it. And it's made, it's made different a difference. But also, I feel like I'm probably in a better place with it. So it hasn't happened as much. So it's kind of a mixture. Yeah. Um, 
but yeah and I haven't really admitted that to anyone before because I was really embarrassed that I got in trouble with my oh. manager like really embarrassed like I don't think I told my partner even until like two or three years after it happened because I was like I don't want you to think I'm a bad worker or like mm. you know like I felt really embarrassed mm. by it um so yeah yeah but, yeah just ask what can you do yeah what can I do what can I do to help you yeah no thank you so much for for sharing that and yeah you're right there is like this I don't know like another entirely separate stigma around just how culturally and societally we're told you have to be you know good at your job you have to work really hard you can't take time off for a break you can't like be distracted or be whatever because that means that you're a bad employee and being a bad employee means you're a bad person um like as if that's a logical like way to think mm -hmm. literally at all um <laughs> but it I'm you know everyone in the audience thinks that I'm terrible at my job I promise you I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I can like, I'm like, oh, God, well yeah. they'll judge they'll judge me as well because like I actually got written up <laughs> yeah I I can well I can promise you almost like 100% that no one thinks that um, it, it wouldn't even cross my mind a little bit. And if anything, <laughs> the only thing that ever crossed my mind through what all of you were saying was, mm, that workplace doesn't seem great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so. I think they would have been a lot better about it had I just like, from the very start, be like, my OCD is driving me mad. I know yeah. I haven't told you about this, but. But I do I, think. I, I, I did eventually admit to it and she, it made a lot more sense to her, but then it just mm. feels like you're making excuses for yourself. So it was the wrong way round, really, which is what I learned from it. Like, like yeah. tell them before things become a problem, not yeah. after. To a degree, Lay though, the groundwork. Yeah, yeah. To a degree, like, the onus <laughs> is on the workplace to provide an environment where that disclosure is welcomed and accepted, though. Like, it, you know, while it's incredible that you can all advocate for yourselves and that's something that is e extremely important. Like, workplaces do need to, you know, at, at the point of entry, be open and upfront about their mental health policies, be upfront about the fact that they're happy to provide reasonable adjustments, whether or not you have, mm -hmm. you know, a mental health condition, because you don't have to have one in order to have accommodations made. And they should, you know, th they should create a culture whereby people can be like, I'm having a really bad time with my OCD at the moment. I might need some extra support or a bit more time or just some more understanding. Um, and it is good that we are seeing it. I'm not like, I'm not going to call them out by name because I don't know if they would want um, me to, but I saw someone um, on Twitter the other day talking about how they had like messaged their manager or whoever just to be like, hey, heads up, I have seasonal affective disorder. Like, if I seem off for the next few months, like that's why it happens every year, it's normal, but like, that's what I've got going on. And I think that kind of thing is really useful as well. Just like that continuous communication kind of back and forth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But yeah. I bet like, I mean, from my experiences anyway, I know that whenever I do tell my boss, he actually really appreciates that I have told him mm -hmm. and that he's then like ready for it. Mm -hmm. So he's not having to be like, the big bad man that's like why aren't you working properly and then finding out. right yeah like i know that he appreciates the fact that he has this knowledge that i go through these things uh same yeah. with my colleagues because then when something does happen they've got that not that they're pre-armed that's not the right word but like you know <laughs> they have this kind of knowledge and background that they can then you know work from to make that easier for them to deal with as well yeah yeah absolutely i guess I guess what I just found hard in my situation was I had the very obvious disability of I'm blind because everywhere I would go, I have my guide dog, obviously. And I still think there is a lot of misconceptions of like, oh, you can't have multiple disabilities. Like you can't right. be this, mm. you know, and I hate to use this word, but in the context of it, you can't be that messed up. You can't have blindness, depression, anxiety, OCD, mo you, you can't have all of that. It's you know, and I guess, you know, for those of us who are dis disabled um, and, you know, have faced discrimination before, because obviously due to my blindness, I've literally been passed over or told no based on my disability, even though they legally said it in a way where they would not get in trouble for denying me. Hmm. Once you get a job, you kind of don't want to use like, you know, in a way kind of make those like this is the reason why I'm not working so good, because you kind of want to be like 
I don't want anyone to know what's going on with me because if I tell them that there's something else rather than just be me being blind, maybe then they're going to be like, oh, maybe this, this isn't the type of employee we actually want. Maybe there's too much going on for them to actually be a proper employee. So I guess that's what I just you know felt wrong in my situation. It's like I already had a disability that they knew about. It's like if I tell them more about myself and disclose even more, Am I going to already start being prejudged or are they yeah. going to start looking at, oh, now you're just making up excuses because you haven't told us about this before. So it is kind of like one, yes, they need to build an environment where we're comfortable to tell them, but there's still a lot outside socially in the, you know, in the conscious of the, you know, every, you know, everyday interactions and, you know, past trauma where we ourselves, even if that environment is welcoming for us, we still feel embarrassed or have doubts that it's going to be received so openly. Yeah. Yeah, that was really well said. Thank you. Um, I have nothing to add. That was just a really good point. <laughs> um, cool. Well, I, I guess to, to kind of round us out before we um, do our outros and, and you can kind of plug anything that you've got going on, um, my, my final question to you all is what is something that you wish people better understood about OCD? You know, if the people watching this now or, or watching it later could kind of, you know, have a, a key takeaway, not necessarily a singular thing, but like a key takeaway um, moving forward, what would that be? Uh, I can't decide who to ask first. I'm going to ask you, Victoria. Sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. Pressure, pressure. Uh, I, I suppose for me is I would like people, I mean, as we've covered several times in this chat it you know ocd is not just can't walk on lines you're very neat like there is so much more and there are many different like shades of ocd there is it, it's a big spectrum of what people experience and how they experience it um and i think the other thing i'd like people to appreciate uh is the fact that it might seem small to you you might not understand why like i can't have crumbs in my butter but for me or for someone going through it that is actually a very big deal to them and it's very you know, like it really is under the skin and in their core. And just to have the understanding that if you can do something to facilitate, to make like, okay, like I'll take the crumbs out or I'll make sure I use a clean knife, just little things like that. Just to do to do that because it really does make such a big difference. If you just appreciate that what might seem small to you is very big to someone else. Um, and yeah, we're not all neat. <laughs> uh, I'm not even going to show you like I've kind of got it arranged like nice pictures and things trust me behind my computer is absolute chaos and you are not going back there guys I definitely identify with the linen closet thing because me and my partner are both quite short and we can't reach our linen closet so I literally want, I fold these tiles nicely and they're all clean and then I go <laughs> and <throw them laughs> the a two-step because we're both so short there is like certain That's storage adorable. in our house that basically our little munchkin selves just can't make any use of um <laughs> incredible i'm picturing you like bilbo baggins or something now like yeah <laughs> <laughs> um mario what what's something you wish people would take away from this yeah it's going to be hard not to repeat because i think we all have the same general feeling that it's 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 something that's kind of deeper um I guess the, I, I it, it would never work in a normal conversation, but like the best way to do it would just be like OCD literally is obsessive compulsion disorder. And when you hear OCD, you hear it almost like a, like OCD is the phrase itself. Mm -hmm. And OCD means to people, you know, uh, like I said, neatness, things in a straight line. Mm -hmm. If you were to literally just say, I have obsessive, obsessive compulsive disorder, I feel like somebody would hear that and be like, you know, there, there are three words there that mean something to me. Like, yes, we obsess. Yes, we have compulsions. And yes, it's a disorder. And like, I, I just wish that you can get past that OCD means this, like this being the colloquial phrase, and OCD means obsessive, obsessive compulsive disorder. I feel like that, like that, just that breaking it apart into the words would really go a long way into somebody taking that next step and being like, oh, there's, I mean, it's got disorder in the title. That's, that's a little more serious than what I see in the movies of putting things in a straight line. Yeah. So it's, it's certainly okay. a long, it's certainly like just hearing what it is, is really the key. 
Yeah, no, that's a great point. Because I think I, I, I kind of alluded to this earlier, but the phrase OCD, just the, the acronym, does have like this huge stigma attached to it because all, t- all the time, like, you know, multiple times a week, I would say probably if I'm like, outside with other people, which is rare, um, you know, people are like, you know, I'm a bit OCD or like, I'm really OCD about that or everyone's a bit OCD. Mm. And that kind of stuff just gets said so often. And it's just so like ingrained in like our like cultural lexicon or or Mm. whatever that it does like saying the full name. It doesn't necessarily have that stigma attached because that's not how people normally hear it. So I think that's a really good point. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Chad, um, if you have any kind of takeaways that you want to add for people. Uh, I mean, obviously, you know, I have to kind of repeat a little bit, but yeah, it's not just we're clean freaks <laughs> <laughs> or everything has to be straight, um, that it's far more debilitating than people can ever imagine, you know, especially when it comes to the intrusive, invasive thoughts. I mean, it, it, it can be so crippling, you, you know, just some people don't want to leave their rooms, leave their beds, have anything to do with their interpersonal relationships. So it's far more than just being neat freaks. Um, but I love what Mario said, honestly. I think we have kind of let the words obsessive compulsive disorder go away in, ter- in lieu of the just saying OCD. And now the public kind of has a hold of the OCD. It's like, oh, yeah, I'm a little OCD. Oh, my mom's such an o- you know, so OCD. It's like we kind of have lost our claim on on the, you know, on that. And I think maybe just we should reclaim it um, and have it, you know, be known that, you know, this 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 is actual disability, you know, language and, you know, why it's wrong to just use it in such a very loose connotation as like, oh, Mm. I'm so OCD because yesterday I did this or I forgot to do that. And now I do that. It's just like, Mm. especially when you're talking to someone with actual OCD, you're now obsessed and like, Oh my god, they don't get it. They don't understand it's like this, that, whatever. It's, just, it's yep. just like, you know, it's just I think there needs to be a reclaim of the fact and maybe we stop using O C D and instead start saying it all the way through. Obsessive compulsive disorder. I, I don't know. I just think what both you Sky and Mario said um was really good and I like it a lot. I think yeah. the same could be said for other I mean like ADHD again. Like I think once we start saying you know i actually don't know fully what it stands for which is i know adhd attention deficit i don't know yeah and attention I think, deficit again, like said, hyperactivity disorder thank you, i always forget what the h is yeah, yeah thank you for that yeah. tonight but it's <laughs> but like, I I think, like every time <laughs> yeah like you said like laying it out in its full form actually makes you realize that this is not just like a flimpy like oh he's so adhd or oh, so, so ocd like you know if we have ownership over the full title i guess yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's one of those things like because ADHD has kind of changed because previously I think it was more known as like ADD, but it does still have mm-hmm. connotations that it's like ADHD is like a hyperactive little boy. Like that's what you think of right. when you think of ADHD and you don't think that it can manifest in any other context. But like, I mean, for myself, I, I have inattentive type ADHD, which means I don't really have a lot of the hyperactive traits that you know are the ones that i think are most commonly diagnosed um so yeah understanding it better matters because yeah like when you hear just the acronym and you don't really know what it what you know all that stuff behind it is it makes it a lot easier to make assumptions about it i think as well um but yeah katie i don't know if you have any thoughts you want to kind of leave us on as well I mean, really, it is. The, I think it's interesting that we've all said the same thing. Like, it's not just it's not just one type, and also that you can have more than one type at a time, um, is kind of interesting. And that throughout your life, you can get different. It can manifest itself in different ways. Like when I was a kid, like I, I it sort of went away. But I, I had like stuff like I used to touch wood obsessively. I used to say things in my head over and over again. Um, I used to, like, use far too much toilet paper. We'll not go into that much detail. Well, yes, well that's wonderful. Why did I say that? Great. That was too much, <laughs> too much um, Honestly, my my mum and dad were tearing their hair out. Like, how did you get through this much toilet paper? Anyway, you know, 
very cleanly. Maybe sometimes it is clean for you. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, <laughs> but like, like the type I've got now is like so, you know, so different. And that's lasted for what, like, I think this is the one that's here to stay, unfortunately. Um, not that any of them are any worse or better than them, but, um, you know, those ones just came and went as a child, like without me having to do anything very specific to get rid of them. But also just that there's some, you know, like as Chad said, it can be so debilitating. There's um, like forms of um, pure OCD, which is, um, I mean, it stands for pure obsession, but you do have compulsions as well. You have compulsions internally, but you know, some people have horrible intrusive thoughts about doing things to children that they would never, ever, ever do, ever. And that's why they're having those horrible thoughts and they are taking them to mean something that they don't mean and mm. um, that can lead people to suicide that type of OCD has a really high suicide rate um, because these people think that they're paedophiles I mean no one wants to talk about this but this you know these are really serious things mm -hmm. um, like can you imagine if you weren't a paedophile but you thought you were one like that is the most distressing thing in the whole world like it's horrendous um, the type of OCD I have is like philosophical OCD it, or sometimes called existential OCD, where you get really obsessed with specific life questions or philosophical questions. Sounds ridiculous. I don't tell people what it is most of the time because it sounds like a non-problem. Um, but, you know, people have become... I, I know of one famous person that had this type of OCD, along with loads of, like, um, addiction problems. And he used to... He was a famous golfer, in fact. My dad told me about him. Apparently, he used to throw people up against walls in pubs and demand to know the meaning of life, and beat them up if he didn't, if they didn't give him a good answer. And you know that these things that can be really, um, it sounds absolutely ridiculous to anyone else, but can be really, really debilitating for people. And there's just, and you know, it's even things like people don't realise hoarding is a type of OCD. Yeah. Um, and that can be apparently one of the hardest types of OCD to crack as well. I mean, people just think, oh, my mom just is constantly, um, you know, she won't get rid of this, that and the other. They don't realise there's so many compulsions behind mm -hmm. and obsessions behind. The, you know, there's a lot of emotion attached to these things for them. Um, so they might get frustrated that they're coming to someone's house and helping them clear out their house every every month. Um, and it just keeps going back to the way it is and there's just there's just so many yeah there's just so many different types that people don't know about um and also the fact knowing about them i think as well will help people understand that they're not going completely insane um it you know there is there is a condition attached to what they're suffering and i think it's important that people know that um so yeah, if you think that you ever find yourself obsessing about anything of any kind, do have a look on the OCD Foundation website because you never know. You might ha you might do a me and find that you've got <laughs> something that you never knew existed and it could change things for you like it did for me. So yeah. Yeah. That was a long spiel. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you so much for it. Uh, and it's interesting that like each of you said that you were repeating what the other person said, but yeah. then yet <laughs> each of you made like a very distinct separate point, which I think was a really good point. Yeah, no, I mean, no, it's really good. I mean, I've been, I've been kind of um, taking some notes to summarize what, what you said and, and we've got like something that might seem small to you would be big for someone else. Um, OCD means obsessive compulsive disorder and we need to get past the kind of colloquial stigma surrounding OCD uh, we're not just clean freaks and it can be far more debilitating than people can imagine uh, and there's more than one type of OCD it can manifest in different ways and it can manifest in different ways throughout your life like those are four entirely individual points and, and I thank you all for for raising them um but yeah well we're um gonna wrap up now i've just popped our find help link um in the chat one last time just in case anyone feels like they might um, need to access those international helplines um but otherwise this panel will be uploaded and available on our youtube channel soon as soon as i can do it um <laughs> <laughs> um but in the meantime um i'll let you all kind of uh you know say goodbye and, and let us people know like 
where they can find you if you want to share socials and stuff like that um or what you're working on if anything um victoria do you have anything that you want to kind of plug before before we finish I just wrote a really cool preview for Alan Wake 2, if anyone wants to go and read that on Eurogamer. Oh, cool. Yes. Yeah. I love really Eurogamer. Big fan of their publications, so I'll check that out for sure. Hell yeah. Cool. And all of these things we can link in the YouTube video description as well. Um, Mario, have you got anything that you want to let people know? Uh, yeah, you could find... Honestly, I'm I'm a very social chatty person so any any one of the social ones uh twitter it's mario mergola even on linkedin honestly mario mergola i'm pretty chatty there too um and on nice. instagram i'm mario the writer so just Excellent. say hi i'm, I'm i'll give you a open. follow yeah nice. i'll fall back i'm pretty open so yeah i'm a little chop shot gal <laughs> nice so awesome for reasons unknown even to me sweet i was when i yeah when you said it through i was wondering actually um but yeah it'll it'll forever be a mystery and i kind of like that um Chad, have you got anything that you want to plug before we before we head off? Yeah, I always got to plug my podcast, The Unsighted Radio. I spell unsighted U-N-S-Y as in Yankee, T-E-D, The Unsighted Radio. You can find it on Amazon Music, Audible, Overcast, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Um, I originally started it as a blind podcast, but now it's just a disability podcast. I talk to anybody with a lived experience, whether it's, you know, someone with a disability themselves, um, someone who has someone in their life that has been living with a disability or chronic health condition, engineers creating assistive technologies or amazing organizations like Safe in Our World. Obviously, if you are someone out there that has a story, please contact me at chad.m as in Michael, dot B as in boy, O-U-T-O-N at gmail.com. Let me know you want to come on. I welcome any and all guests that have something they would like to share. Um, even if you think it's not an important story, trust me, it's an important story. It should be shared, and I would love to share it. Um, also, check out adapt-it.co.uk. It's an awesome assistive technology company that I am involved with now as a business partner. I love what they do, especially when it comes to gaming. We do a lot of initiatives with accessible gaming and making sure that people living with a disability in a chronic health condition can keep playing games no matter what it is they're living with. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. Actually, wow. That was also like really well rehearsed, I think. Yeah, really. <laughs> like you nailed that. Give a script. Dude, I here. Yeah. I need to go re back and redo mine. Katie, you have to follow that now. I'm sorry. Oh my god, there is no, there is no following that. There okay. No um, I so I although I you might have noticed I'm very chatty in real life. Um, I'm not really on the socials all that much. Uh, my Facebook lapsed a very long time ago. I have currently literally a picture of myself on LinkedIn, and that's it. And um, I have a closed Instagram account, but I am totally open to um. People like contacting me on my work email, which is katie, K -A -T -Y, dot Robson, R O B S O N, at ubisoft.com if anyone wants to chat more about OCD or um, anything like that. Um, do you get, get in touch? That's cool. Nice. And I have nothing to plug because I have a normal nine to five job <laughs> in, <laughs> where, I, where I go to a studio and do HR work and then live a normal life. <laughs> so I have Don't undersell yourself. <laughs> it's fine. I'm loving. I'm loving life, but um, unfortunately, I do not have a podcast. Yeah. Well, that might be fortunate for a lot of you guys. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, everyone, so much. And thank you, Chachi, who said in chat. I uh, just want to say thank you to everyone for such an for such interesting thoughts and information. Um, oh, but yeah, we will we'll upload this to YouTube soon. We'll put it on our um, socials when we do, which is at Safe in Our World on everything. Um, and we'll be back for another panel um, probably next month. But yeah, thank you everyone. Bye. Thank you.